everyone. Welcome back to Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Uh, we look forward to this and, and every other week when we're doing this now. And so uh, we're here to answer questions and do whatever we can do to help you guys out. Um, well, we had a, a busy week again last week. We, guys are purchasing parts. You can tell it's getting race season. We've had some guy, you know, we got got some races under our belts last weekend. Uh, Beatrice and, and Thayer and uh, Batesville ran. And uh, congratulations to Jeff Taylor. I see he won down at Batesville, which, of course, you would almost expect him to win at Batesville in, in a sense. But uh, congratulations to him. And so that was pretty cool. We get to, get to see a lot of racing. Taylor Cool ran second in, in Coca Paw, so she's having a, a good year with her new, her new car. So it's been pretty good. So what's new and exciting at Weir's Machine? Pretty much the same grind. Today was Monday, and it's always really chaotic on Monday, and getting all the last minute uh, pieces out to the guys that are finishing up their cars and getting ready for the season. Like you said, it's uh, it's coming up quick here and getting rolling. Yeah, we've got four more cars to do, and then we're finally caught up. And and I can tell you by the, you know, the guys in the back shop are doing a great job. The guys in the shock room are doing a great job. Everybody's been busting their butt. But you can kind of tell that we're ready for a little warmer weather and a little bit nicer conditions and a little bit more racing. I see the rock star took his – tires and wheels home off of his car last weekend and did some tire work getting ready so he's going to be ready to go here probably in a couple weeks and and uh so yeah it's, it's exciting i mean racing's going and everything's pretty exciting i heard a rumor are they moving the frostbusters back a week i hope so uh the weather's not i mean if they if they don't um yeah i don't know that for a fact but our weather forecast is not friendly yeah yeah i was trying to continue winter uh, this morning was a little, little chilly up here <laughs> yeah that's kind of been the way it's been here we've had so much wind that you know even today got up to like 44 degrees but the wind was so bad that i'm still out there in my sweatshirt and and uh um Got, got 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 my sweatshirt and my jacket on and my gloves walking the dogs and I'm thinking you know it's, it's about time to just have my sweatshirt on or something that's funny Rocky I was gonna ask if you took the tires home to put them on the rotisserie <laughs> <laughs> got them real soft well I walked in this morning and there was tires missing I'm thinking hmm should I ask about this or I'll just wait and see what's going on here. I told him this too. We we got to do a video this year of tires because we need we need that for the schools because that would be uh, answer a lot of the questions that we get on how to to sand the tires and stuff like that and and so we're I'm kind of making a list of more video instructional type videos for the schools. I think that'll just be more clarity. Uh, if people can actually see it since we can't actually physically do some of this stuff at the schools, so whatever, but whatever, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So what, uh, have you got any, oh, so you've been doing some home or some home improvement or some shows, uh, uh, boat shows, stuff like that, right? Yeah, we've what? got. We've done four uh, outdoor shows the last six weeks, I think, with our our out, other brands, our sister companies. So the the scorekeepers for the games and and the game carrier to carry out the turkeys and the coyotes, and and then uh, our newest company, which is the the Trace My Space, which is the foam to organize your toolboxes. So uh, that that's a lot of fun. Uh, different crowd. I, I freak out some people occasionally because they come to that show and then when they realize it's weird's machine they're like wait a second what are you doing here so yeah i bet there was actually a racer last weekend from minnesota that was there and he came around the corner and he's like what are why aren't you in bristol <laughs> yeah there you go yeah it's there you go it looks like that all went kind of well they had some dqs down there and some stuff like that but uh it looked like that racing went the racetrack looked good yeah, racing was good. Racetrack was in good shape. So hopefully I have another good week this week. And 
Yeah. And then was it two weeks in the cup guys were there? I'm not sure. I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at that. I know that, uh, it's yeah, gotta be Brickman, Talladega and then Bristol. I think that sounds right. Yeah. 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 The, uh, that was a pretty good race on Sunday. That's kind of, it was, it was kind of chilly and I didn't have the, uh, I, I wanted to take some of my fishing rods over to the local lake. I've got some jackhammer baits on three rods, and I kind of want to try to pick out which rod I think is going to be the best, which, whatever, how would I really know? But anyway, the, um, uh, but I didn't go because of, um, I don't do this freezing thing, man. I just, so I sit and watch the race, and that was actually pretty good. Yeah, that's what some of the boys said today was a pretty good race. I didn't get yeah. a chance. It got real exciting there that last lap. I mean, it was you didn't know who was going to win that thing there for a while. It was going to be between three guys one way or the other. But anyway, uh, question. Jeremy's got a question. He says, have you guys uh, had any success running electrical cooling fans? Um, I can't say that I haven't had any success or have had it. I have, I have no knowledge about that, to be honest with you. Um, I don't. Elect electrical yeah. cooling asphalt cars use the the electric fans a lot of them do uh just to take the fan off the engine to gain power uh you do need an alternator i believe to run that because it drains the battery so much mm. yeah well that makes sense uh, that, that definitely makes sense uh sandra's wanting to know if we're thinking about doing more advanced setup schools at this point um yeah sandra we're kind of thinking about that um it's just a situation, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the downside to the uh, the way some of the schools work now is because we have so, such a mixed variety of people in the school. Their knowledge level is so, so uh, stretched from one extreme to the next, and so we've kind of got to cater to everybody, which kind of makes it boring for the people that actually know. So we'll think about that, and uh, not saying that I'm not – interested in doing that uh um you know something we might do uh ryan what would happen if you raised the right rear top bar a hole on the frame and lowered the right rear bottom bar a hole raise the right well if you raise the top bar up hole and you lowered the right rear lower bar a hole that would make it uh well it's going to make it tight getting in because the you're you're going to have you're you're taking steer out of it when you drop that right lower bar, so that's going to make the car tighter. It's going to be tighter getting in when you put more angle in that upper bar because it's going to technically make it think like you put a stronger or a stiffer spring in the car, so it's going to tighten it up. I would think that thing would be extremely tight getting in the corner. Um, once you got back on the throttle and got it turned, I'm afraid it might be a little free up off the corner with a lot of bar angle in that right rear, but it's it's definitely going to make the car tight on corner entry, no doubt about it. Yeah, that's kind of fighting each other when you raise the top and, and lower the bottom like that. That's Yeah. You're, you're trying you're, to do two different things there. Yeah, you're just stiffening that whole bar package, and, and that's, it's going to make it more rigid. Um, Chris wants to know what size master cylinders do you run on the IMCA stock car? I run all one inch. Um, all the, the new cars that we built this year, the new stock cars that we built this year, we put one inch in both of them. And uh, uh, that that's pretty good. Okay, we got one of our new stock cars in there to start scaling it today. So the boys are going to, well, they, they, they changed that rule on that left upper cup what you could do so now you have to go back to a regular upper cup on the left front because the, the way paul had it, he had the left front so it's kind of sawed off and it was a uh, i don't know if you ever seen it but it it actually had a kind of a ball bearing down inside and you could turn it but you could it didn't have the you had all kinds of air a-frame clearance rather than having a jack bolt stick up there so they eliminated or they, that that's no longer legal so we've got they got, had to order one and we didn't i didn't have a, a three-quarter stock uh, in stock and so we got from got got one from our good buddies at performance bodies rather than 
ordered it direct for you, Chad. We ordered it from them, so we'd have it tomorrow. Day closer. It's one day closer. Uh, Old Seven Garage. Hello, guys. I've got an awesome notebook from these videos. Thanks so much. I can't wait to put your knowledge together in use. So did you get my uh, checklist uh, there, old, old Number Seven Garage? I sent those to you sometime last week, I think. Uh, if you didn't get them, uh, check your spam folder or whatever. I, I sent them from my Harris Clash email, which is Harris Clash, Bob at HarrisClash.com. What's the best chassis on the market for an open EMOD? Well, you know, it's really hard to say what's the best chassis on the market today because any more – there isn't anybody that doesn't make a good race car. I mean, most all these race cars are all sisters. I mean, they, they all look nice. The biggest key is all about who you're working with. I mean, it's it's the relationship with the chassis builder or a chassis builder's dealer or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't – I'd hate to even say what would be the best because there's, like I said, there. it's all in the relationship with the chassis builder, in my opinion, nowadays. I mean, because it's, it's been a long time since I've seen something that I thought was really poor quality. I mean, it, it, everybody's pretty much stepped up to the plate and, and done a really good job. For sure. Yeah, it's 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 kind of gotten a little bit regional, you know, like Rage is nationwide, GRT is nationwide. Uh, but some of the other chassis builders are, are you know, Shaw's nationwide. It just all depends on, like I said, who, who you want to work with. Well, tire shortage, if you can't find any 20s, would it affect anything to run a big 19 on the right rear? Well, actually, I'd rather run a big 19 on the right rear, to be honest with you. It's a flatter tire. Uh, you got better surface, in my opinion, on the tire. Uh, I don't think they bow. They don't buckle in the middle quite as much as that crown tire does. Uh, if you can find big 19s, that'd be gold. Um, you talked in a former episode about J-bar changes at the frame mount versus the rear end, and the rear end being two times the effect. Can you discuss changing four bar links at the frame versus the cage? Is up on the cage, the same as down on the frame. Uh, I'll, I'll let you start with that one, Chad. Chad I, it wouldn't be the same. So uh, same kind of principle. On the rear end side, it's always going to be more effective than the, than the frame side. Uh, kind of going back to what that previous question just a little bit ago where you're trying to move two bars, uh, you, need to, you need to do one thing at a time. So... If you're going to raise it on the frame, you would do raise on the frame. If you're going to raise or lower it on the cage, raise or lower it on the cage. You don't want to get to where you're doing two things at the same time. Um, I would say that it's probably more popular to change the frame side than the cage side. Uh, but yeah, the problem with the, the frames, when you do it on the cage, you're changing more timing. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. really fast. I mean, you're, that's a big change to do it on the cage. Um, so, I mean, I would be careful, you know, I, I get criticized a lot for having too many holes in my cages, uh, but there is advantages, but you have to understand where and what you're doing there. Uh, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to get out in left field, uh, but, you know, I would recommend doing one side at a time and one hole at a time because they're big changes. I would agree. I mean, you're, if say if you drop it on the right rear, you're you're increasing the angle, but the problem is is you're changing the timing. Where if you raise it on the frame, you're just increasing the angle. You're not changing timing, so it's it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Okay, Chris, what does putting trail or lead in the left rear of an IMCA stock car do for the race car? Well, anytime you put trail or lead, say, for example, if you put trail in the car where the right side wheelbase was longer than the left side, that car is going to definitely roll into the corner nice. It's going to want to turn pretty good. 
but it might want to tail out coming off the corner. The putting lead in the car is going to tighten it up a little bit getting into the corner, but it's still a roll in the middle of the corner pretty decent, but it's definitely going to make the car tighter coming off the corner. The problem with the stock car rules is you've got to make such a big adjustment that, you know, with our modified stuff, you can make an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch adjustment, where with the stock car stuff, uh, unless this is a stock car that's out in Pennsylvania, um, you can't, you know, those stock arms, you've got to have separate holes, which is like a half inch or a little over a half inch apart. So it's kind of a big, it's a big swing to do it, in my opinion, that much. Um, IMCA modified open motor. Where do you suggest hanging the extra weight for rear percentage over the rear end or further back? Well, I'm not a real big believer in any weight being behind the fuel cell. Um, I don't mind having some beside the fuel cell, but if I had to add a lot of weight, I would put it in front of the fuel cell so it's over the rear end. Um, I got I lose my questions here. Um, but anyway, that would be my opinion is just uh, putting the extra weight above the rear end right in front of the fuel cell. Don't do what I used to do. I used to do what was easy and throw it on the bumper right behind the fuel cell. That's bad. Yeah, that uh, if you're going in a straight line, that's not a bad situation. But when you have to turn that thing, driver's got to be really careful on turning that car because if it starts to go around it's gonna go around no doubt about that um best way to check stock chevelle lower control arms if they're bent or not well connor i feel stupid here because i can't answer that question either the way we check our um Chevelles, which I would think that the the uh, uh, the impala or the the metric stuff would be the same way. We actually uh, basically lay the A-frame so it's on the floor with the spring bucket down and measure up to where the ball drain is. And, and, and our our A-frames bend quite a bit right there out at the tip. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the metric A-frames have more of an issue of twisting than they do um, bending out at the chip. But I, I, that's, that's a question for my old buddy, Paul Berger, because I, I just have not had enough experience yet with that stock car lower A-frame to give you a... He asked uh, about Chevelle. He said Chevelle. It's oh, said he did Chevelle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Stock We're Chevelle. We're actually, i let the cat out of the bag here, but we're working on a tool. That would be awesome. Because For, on the car checking. That would be very good. Yes. Stay tuned. You heard it here first on Bob and Chad. That would be an awesome deal because, you know, I have to take that thing off and lay it in on a flat surface. What we do is we actually lay it on a flat surface and measure up to where the ball joint goes and it's five and a quarter inches. If it's more than that, it's bent. And that outer lip bends, and they won't allow us to reinforce that, so the outer lip doesn't bend so much. Um, it's just, just one of them rules. Now I got to get it done before everybody else does. Well, I'd get working on that first thing tomorrow. <laughs> uh, my guys Hopefully are going to design staff on that project ASAP. Yeah. And I and I know who's going to get the first couple to to check out. So my good buddy have, Bob, you, you got my address, right? I do. Yes. Okay, good. Just double checking there. Yeah. And thanks again for those shirts. Problem is Bob swelled up a little too much in the middle, and, and they were they made me look like I was partially pregnant or something. Well, give them to Bobby, and I'll get I'll send some bigger. I sent them back to you. You did? Yeah. Oh, they didn't even tell me that. Yeah, I, I sent them back to you because I figured you'd, you know. Well, you could have uh, gave Bobby and Rocky I one. I could have probably gave them. No, Rocky wouldn't be able to fit in it either. 
He's tubby too. Yeah, him and I are kind of well. He's just stockier, so he just needs a little bigger. I mean, not he doesn't have the belly problems that I have. He's just bulkier. Uh, on a UMPA on a UMPA mod, would you consider too much of a distance from the center line of the axle to the pull bar? I hear 10 to 12 inches is pretty good. Am I correct? That 10 to 12 inches is kind of a goal. We're, we're right at 11. Uh, that 10 inch number, I think is pretty good. Uh, or 10 to 12 is pretty good range. You get below that and, and it makes everything happen too quickly. It, it makes everything, it stiffens everything up to the point where it's, 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 it's not as forgiving. It's got more traction but it's easier to bust the traction loose. You get above that 12 inches and the thing's just lazy. It, it just doesn't doesn't want to do anything. It, it just gets it, it just gets too lazy. Okay. Well, hi Mike. Uh, Mike Lerner, he was one of the, the, the guy from California that sat in the front row uh, out there at the uh, Pennsylvania school. Uh, having forward drive problems on a three link with a pull bar car has good hike, little forward drive, left rear is 20, 24 degrees, right rear is 10, 54, rear 140 pounds of bite, late model tire, um, lower bars mounted below, close to the rear end housing. Both springs are in front of the axle. Any suggestions? Um, well, I would try to split that angle a little bit more. The 24 degrees isn't bad if you could get 28, but taking a little angle out of that right rear is going to make the car a little tighter getting in, but uh, it's definitely going to make it tighter coming off. Uh, 140 pounds of bite with that good tires, quite a bit. Um, you might be just overworking and you might think that your left rear is not biting, but maybe it's the right rear that's not carrying you through the corner. Uh, you start getting that much. I don't know, I'm not a big believer in a whole lot of split. Um, I'm still old school at 60 pounds of bite seems to be pretty good. Now, um, these percentages, are these with the driver or without the driver? Uh, and those degrees, are they with the driver or without the driver? Because if they're without the driver, keep in mind that your 24 degrees goes down to about 22 and a half to 22. And so you might want to start a little higher on angle on that left rear. Yeah, I'd say when that wedge number is that high and that gets you into the corner free, and then yeah. that big yeah. angle on that right rear as the car starts compressing, it's going to wheelbase back and it's probably just carrying you. Yeah carrying you loose probably that's my opinion i i think that 140 pounds of bite like you said it gets gets it makes the car getting free getting into the corner carries it in through the middle and then that degree of angle is going to keep the tail wanting to keep going um you know uh, i'd put some lead in the car maybe uh you know lengthen my left side trailing arm a little bit that would be a thought, but I, I think I definitely, with those good tires on there, I'd probably lean away from some of that bite. I think that's quite a bit. Hi, Joey Wallace. How you doing? How's my old buddy, Mr. Schrader? Uh, I see you guys were uh, racing last weekend in Batesville, and uh, hope you had fun. Hope you got, are you keeping that, that, that old guy out of trouble, or? You know how's how's he doing anyway? I haven't seen I haven't seen Mr. Schrader for a couple of years. Uh, last time I seen him was two years ago when we were up to uh, Clash at the Creek. We got to get him to the Clash. We need to get him at the Clash. He, he that that him and that racetrack would do very well. He would he would be really good at that place. Um, when the track goes slick for the main, would you rather move the right rear, right rear bar on the frame or add a half inch spacer to the left rear? Track is high bank and the races races well everywhere. 
Well, raising the bar or changing a bar versus a wheel spacer, they kind of do two different things in a sense. Their end result would be very similar, but um, moving the right bar, right bar on the frame, um, you know, if you, if you drop it, the car's going to get lazier on you. It's going to feel like you put a softer spring in the car. It's going to definitely help it come off the corner, but I'm kind of afraid it might tighten it up too much in the middle and make the car lazy in the middle. The half-inch wheel spacer basically is just going to help you off the corner. It might free you up just a little bit getting in, which I don't think is probably a bad thing on some of the slick racetracks, but once you're under traction, uh, that right rear or that left rear being out a little bit more is definitely going to make the car try to drive up off the corner straight here. Um, Connor says he'd be interested in that, Chad. A lot of people probably will be. They will just copy you anyway. So you just got to, yeah, do them first, sell some, and give somebody something to copy. Make tools to press in the A arm straight. Oh yeah, actually, that's that's not a bad idea either. Taking making something that would actually press yeah. that outside clip or the outside lip back down wouldn't be a bad idea either. To be honest with you, because the the problem it is the metal that's in something in, in, in the lower days not the greatest stuff in the world plus the fact that it's that little lip out there has no support and we're loading the right fronts on these cars i mean they they, they just bend and, and i i hate to say it but i think a right front lower a-frame is almost a, a, a dispensable product anymore i mean it's just one of those yeah. deals you don't have to hit anything five six nights that thing's allowed to be bent and it's just because of the stress that we're putting on everything on that right front corner. Um, okay. Gary put greasers in his Weir's bird cages with lightweight rust proof grease. Should I use the lightest grease I can get in them? Yeah, I would, I would definitely use a synthetic grease. Um, and putting zerks in your cages isn't bad we don't do it just because the the bearings are sealed if you unhook the bars and shocks and spin the cages and and do the main there generally isn't a problem we like to put grease on the tube when we slide the cage on to to make a water barrier then i would use the thickest oldest grease you can find just to make a good water barrier but definitely there's guys that put zerks in cages and that's not a bad uh idea uh and a, not an issue the only thing that I would watch is you can pop out the the seals in the in the bearings. So if you overpack that and you keep packing it full of grease, you'll pop them uh, the dust seals out of the bearings. So you need to watch that for sure. But I would use this, if you're going to pump it full of grease, I'd put a synthetic in there then. But they're going to probably sweat and drip oil all the time. So it's a little bit more to to clean that up. But definitely a good idea. There's lots of guys that do that. You know, whatever you do, don't take the pressure washer to get rid of that grease. Yeah. Uh, Shane, advantages or disadvantages to running the left rear shock behind on a four-link modified A mod? Um, there's a lot of advantages to straight line traction. Uh, it, it definitely has more forward traction than the shock in front. The downside to it is, of course, the the shock that you run behind is going to kind of have to be. A, a different valve shock than what you would run in the front and the problem that a lot of guys run into is they gain forward traction but the downside is is we lose a little bit of corner entry stability when we take that shock off the front because that shock off the front uh, is, is actually helping to stabilize the car once you're off or you know once you enter the corner and so it's kind of a driver preference um i see a see them both ways uh, and, and we've tested them both ways and I've not had anybody tell me that that left rear behind didn't I mean, everybody says it increases forward traction it just makes the car a little bit more unstable getting into the corner 
Uh, does an aftermarket tubular lower control arm allow more travel than the stock A-frame, Chevelle A-frame? Uh, yes. They look like they would. Yeah. I don't know how much. I probably should get that data. Well, you know, we got them on the shelves. That, are you that, putting them? That'd be a good project for me to do tomorrow. Well, you're putting them tubulars on that UMP car, so oh, you could do it. Right. So we could do that. You bet. We'll have that data in two weeks. Yeah. Well, there might be four, but we'll have it. <laughs> yeah. That, um, asked a question on here a couple weeks back, and Chad emailed me the information to me right away. Just impressed. Wanted to thank you for the customer service. Well, I, that's what we strive for here. Uh, we don't only want to make the best products, but we want to treat our customers the best and uh, and provide the best support. And that's kind of how I train all my people. And I try to lead by example. So if I'm doing a good job, they should do a good job right behind me. So uh, thank you for that, Ryan. And that's what we try to do every day here. So. Oh, yeah. I got I got to make sure I talk about it's 126 days to the Harris Clash, August 2nd, the 31st annual Harris Clash. Registration is open, so all of you that are planning on coming, we need to get on that and get registered. And and uh, if you're conserving fuel this year, make sure you save all your fuel money so you can come to the Harris Clash. How's the finances look? Is it going to be 10000 to win again? No, it's, odds are slim that that's going to happen, right? It's That's, probably going to be a little less than that. Is that up to me again? It might be up to you again. I'll work on my buddies. Okay. Pat, oh, I hope you're watching, Pat. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? Is, Pat, is Pat's budget any better than it used to be, or is it worse than it used to be, or is it about the same? I guess we'll I have know. to wait and see, huh? We'll have to find out. We'll have to find out. Okay, I might have hit this thing and missed a question. It, it should be at... Uh, my wife didn't marry me for my money. She married me for my good looks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, USR and BMOD started. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah, everybody, yeah. Um, we'll just let that one go. USRA B mod starting starting spot for the left front chain limiter. How much drop? Then how do you shorten it for a dry slick racetrack? Well, you know the drop's going to be kind of uh, uh, up. You know on how much angle. The big key on drop. That, Everybody's got to think of when, you know, because I can tell you four inches, I can tell you five inches, three and a half, I can give you a number. But the big thing is, is to do you know, do your research at home in your garage, take the right front spring out of, the, out of the car, lower it down to where it's riding at, at your, uh, what your actually, your dynamic mode is, jack the car up underneath the seat and, and jack it up to the point where you're, trailing arm is running at about a 45 degree angle and whatever that is that really needs to be your maximum drop or at least your center point for your drop so you can either choke it down a little bit or raise it up a little bit that's the best way to get for your car and your notebook and your whole program is to do that research now in the garage you still got time heck it's only 735 here since you're, you're you're still on hopefully you're on central time if you're on pacific time it's only 8 35 that's not too late and, and if, you, if you're on uh east or west coast time you got plenty of time to do this so anyway but what i would do on a, on a dry slick race there i don't know i don't really know if i would shorten it up because the problem what you run into is if you shorten that chain up on a dry slick racetrack, you're not hitting the corner as hard getting into the corner. So you're not getting the right front travel that you really need to have to the point where shortening that chain up could actually make the car too tight 
because it's not getting you the, the roll on the right front. So that's just my opinion. Left front, Bob. What? He asked about the left front chain. Oh, left front chain. Sorry. I was thinking I read left rear. God, I gave you a whole story for nothing here. We'll start all over, Tim. Yeah, hey, we covered the left rear. Now we're on the left front. Now we'll tell you the story on the left front since you really wanted to know. Um, the left front chain, I set that thing in the middle. So I've got an inch and a half of drop. I, I take my shock, whatever my shock travel is, I let my shock out. So it's got an inch and a half of drop. And that's where I center my chain. Then from there, when it gets dry slick, I definitely would shorten it up. You've got to be a little careful not to go too far because when you do shorten the chain up on the left front, we already covered the left rear, so we're not going there anymore. Uh, on the left front, when you uh, shorten it up a little bit too much, it can actually take a little bit of side bite out of the right rear and, and make the car a little skaty getting in. So you got to be a little bit careful. But if you can keep the rear end underneath you, shortening that chain up will definitely give you drive up off the corner. Because when it goes to left, it transfers the weight to the left rear tire. Oh, Joey says the old guy's doing good. Chad's keeping us hooked up on great products. So, well, you, you tell Mr. Schrader that we talked, tell him hi, and say he's still my hero. Mine too. I was at his last Winston Cup win, 1991. No kidding. At Atlanta. I was there. Awesome. That would have been cool. Okay, um, how much left side wheelbase loss is too much from steer? Well, it's kind of another one of those deals where you, you kind of got to do that thing on jacking that, that left rear up and dropping that right front and seeing what your travel is. In my opinion, once you get over two and a half inches, that's starting to get too much. But that car will have a sweet spot in it. And what you want to do is you want to take and uh, say a, a dynamic or a, a static, measure a, a spot on your frame to the rear end. and Say it's 16 inches. I, I don't know what it would be, 15 inches, whatever. Then do this little test where you jack it up underneath the seat and you drop the right front and see where it goes to there. And eventually you're going to get a number where you're going to find the magic spot in that in that car that really likes two and a half, two and a quarter. It's going to have a magic spot that that car is going to really want to like. And you're going to want to remember that to turn around it when you change the chain or any of that stuff, because that's or if you put lead or trail in it, you're, you're always going to want to cross reference to that magic number that you had. That's one of those deals where if you go out and you annihilate the field, that's another one of those magic numbers that you need to find because the car is going to tell you that they really like that. Uh, with soda now allows tethers on the left front on most of the cars. Must have slack at static. What will that do once it has tension? Well, once again, you know, if, if you're measuring that thing that, that's static and it has slack on it, you, you know, if you've got an inch and a half of drop, it's going to have some slack on it. So you're going to be able to do the same thing in a sense with that tether is what you could with a chain. Now, if they don't allow a chain, I'd have multiple length tethers. So that I, you know, that'd be something that I could adjust. Because uh, when it does come up and, and that chain or that tether goes tight, it's going to transfer that load to the left rear tire. Hi, guys. I have a B mod. What's the degree should I use for my pull bar and my J bar? Thanks. Um, degree on the pull bar, you know, I still kind of stick right in that 14, 15 degree range. Uh, I know there's some guys that are dropping them, running them a little bit flatter. Uh, we that's something we're going to play with a little bit this summer or the spring, but right now we haven't had an opportunity to, to do that, dropping that thing down, um, but uh, 14 degrees there. Um, 
Panard bar, it's kind of depends on the car and the length of the Panard bar, so it's hard to give you a degree. Um, I usually start with six inches of split. So wherever it is on the rear end, which normally I run it about an inch and a quarter above center of the rear end, and then I run it uphill to the frame six inches. Chad, wanted to give you a huge thanks. Building this car from weeds up, I ordered all the parts both both on really parts and appreciate the craftsmanship well you know i agree with you buddy that's why we buy all our stuff from weirs i mean i had one guy in in the shop the other day said do you ever use anything but weirs i said do i look like i have an s on my forehead seriously when they got the best quality they got the best service and my old buddy chad why would i even think of doing something different than that because we get the stuff. It's just not a problem. So well, thanks. I, uh, that's pretty cool. And uh, and a shout out to to Mr. Nash too. The old number seven garage. I mean, let's face it. The the real TV these days is absolutely terrible. I mean, why not watch YouTube uh, channels with racing? Old number seven garage. Chase Holland, Hunt the Front. I mean, that's that's all we watch at home. My kids are the ones that found these guys first. Uh, they do such a great job representing us, and and it's so cool uh, pulling that old car out. It's pretty badass and watching that. And you know, we don't even really watch TV anymore at home because it's all crap anyway. So uh, I love the the YouTube reality shows. It's really uh, really an awesome deal. Uh, Mark, long story. Mistakenly jigged a 58-inch rear end for my new sport mod. Chassis builder calls for a 60-inch rear end. What issues am I going to fight? Well, I would definitely want to make sure it's centered. Um, 58 inch rear end is going to make the car tight getting in. Um, could make it a little free getting off. Um, I, I wish I could give you something promising that I would say that would make that all better. I think you're going to... You know, you're definitely going to have to run three-inch wheels. There's no four-inch wheel for sure because that the thing would be so tight getting in that it would be terrible. Um, the issues you're going to be, it, it's going to be tighter getting in, and then once it breaks traction, it's going to, you know, be a little bit freer coming off. Oh, Justin said he was like 45 degrees, so that would be, you, you'd be good on that one then. On an IMCA Sport Mod with a turn stub, with a new wheelbase rule, what's the best way to adjust the wheelbase to get within the one-inch tolerance? Uh, well, you're definitely going to want to get from your chassis builder or find out what the square, how to make sure the rear end is square in the car. And if the rear end is square in the car, keep in mind if your stub is, say your stub has turned five eighths of an inch and you've got uh, six degrees caster in it, uh, that right front wheel is going to actually only be ahead probably three eighths of an inch, uh, half an inch at the most. Where you're going to run into the problem, and I really don't see this rule being an issue, but where you could run into the problem is if you tried to run a lot of trail in your car with a turn stub, that's going to get you flirting with some danger there. If you run lead in the car or the rear end's fairly square in the car, I, I don't. I think the one-inch tolerance is going to be, be fine, uh, in, in my opinion. I don't see it being the issue that a lot of people are concerned about. I think the one inch tolerance is, is plenty good on IMCA's part. Um, I know you've gone over this in the past, but what is the pros and cons of running a coilover set up on the left rear of an IMCA modified? Um, well, in fact, we just actually talked about that a little bit, a little bit ago. And it's kind of the same, same thing as uh, you know, running the spring and shock together behind the housing. It's definitely going to give you more straight line traction. The problem with it is, is it can actually make the car 
um, not as comfortable getting into the corner because the shock in front of the housing actually helps the car settle itself down getting into the corner. But uh, you're going to, you, the car's going to be a little bit spookier getting in, a little bit maybe uh, inconsistent, I would say. Driver's going to definitely have to hit his marks a lot tighter. His window's going to be a lot narrower. Uh, but traction-wise, that, that, that left rear behind the housing definitely has traction. I've seen guys go to that and go back away from it just because uh, corner entry was a little more unpredictable. What happens when you shorten or lengthen the right rear chain? Uh, I'll let you have that one, Chad. You can wreck your race car like my brother did one night. <laughs> so the the right rear chain is is can be really dangerous. Uh, you know you want to start with an inch and a quarter, inch and a half gap from ride height. Let it droop. Uh, what we're trying to do there is we're just trying to keep some spring tension on there as you're climbing the bars going down the straightaway, so you maintain some load on there. Uh, and as you tighten that chain up, you will increase traction. But if you tighten that chain up and really like that traction and you get a rough track, it, when that chain tightens and you go through a bump, it shoots the car to the right. You have no control. So it's really a, it's a tuning tool for sure. Is there an advantage? Of course there is. It's got to be slick. And we had an instance one night where my brother, when we first started doing this like 15 years ago, and we tightened that chain up and it got a ton of grip. He's like, oh, my God, I feel like Superman. Go more. Well, and we went more for the feature and turn one developed a hole because guys were bottoming out and got into that hole and just destroyed the right front because that chain was tight and he couldn't steer he's like i don't know what the hell happened and that's what it was the the chain was so it's you really got to be careful i'd say in that three quarter to one and a quarter one and a half range you tighten that baby up and you get a rough track and you're going to wish you hadn't yeah yeah i seen i seen some pictures from one of the racetracks this weekend where I think all everything but the right rear was off the ground. That would not be the ideal time to tighten the chain. Um, thanks, Mike. And thanks again for coming out to that school. I appreciate it. I got, it was nice getting to meet you, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed having some conversations. Um, left rear air pressure on IMCA Modified, 9.5 to 10.5 air versus 12.5 to 13.5. Sidewall deflection versus straightaway traction. Well, keep in mind when you have sidewall deflect deflection, it's not going to the 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 the, the, the tire is going to actually buckle on the treads. So you might think that you're getting straightaway traction, but you're actually hurting that tire more than you're helping it because you're allowing it to buckle and. Uh, We've got a video that we use at the clash, I mean, at the, at the classes that actually shows the tire and the deflection and running too low air pressure and how that tire actually buckles. It uh, definitely is uh, not a good idea. I would stay with that 12.5 to 13 for sure. Um, I've run 14 um, just because I want to make sure that tire is as flat as it can be. The sidewall is not designed to do any buckling. Okay. You all both sell pull bars. Whose is the best? Well, you know, that's a great question. I think both of them are pretty dang good. Um, We're both winning races. Yeah, I mean, we've got, we've sold the pan or Chad's pull bar to some guys and they're winning some races. We had a good weekend last weekend where we won some races. So I'm not going to say that ours is better than Chad's. Uh, I think they both are a very good quality piece and uh, just kind of just depends on on uh, your situation and what, which, what direction you want to go. We can sell you either or, not a problem. uh okay to chad talking about the left front slack once the slack is gone it will lift the weight from the suspension and the wheel and you can feel the car stop lifting the nose 
and laying on the right rear. If you don't have enough left front drop, it makes the car tight entering in the corner. And as the timing, you know, I would agree with all of this stuff there. Kyle, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Oh, yeah, just FYI, RTI bought a brand new computer. Nice. Bigger screen for those old guys could see it a little better. Yeah. Don't have to hand this book to Ben and say, could you read this? Because I can't actually read it on the screen right now. Um, Jason Cox, would would you remember a rookie? Would you remember a rookie our car owner learn and use the load stick for a setup? I tell you what, a rookie driver would be the best one to learn the load stick setup because he needs he needs the information more than anybody. What's your opinion, Chad? Exactly. I mean, the the load stick is an awesome tool, especially when you're when you're learning and. The biggest advice I'm going to give you is I don't know what you have for a chassis, uh, who you're talking to, but the load stick, I, I see guys really benefit from it, and then I see some other guys get out in left field. You really need to focus on your car, your notebook, your bobber, as uh, our buddy Hot Carl would say. You need to, to build a, a notebook for your car. So I don't know what you got for a chassis, but the biggest thing is to scale your car Get your center to centers, get the load stick on there, and start writing down the data. And then when you go to the racetrack, you know you can accurately change a spring. Uh, and go to the racetrack, you can paint the shock shaft with a Sharpie, watch the dust ring, not the rubber, and go out, make a run, find that data, come back in, push the car down to that dust ring or the Sharpie line, measure that center to center, write it down and put the stick on there and go to that number and get that down number. The more you guys use your tools, the more you learn why you're good, when you're good, why you were terrible, that's only going to make you better and only going to make you better sooner than, you know, having all these cool tools that we didn't have back when I was a crew chief. You know, you can learn so much more now than you could back then. We had to do it on feel and we had to do it on math. You know, we were doing the per inch calculations of the of the spring rate so definitely i mean you you will learn just make sure you're comparing your car to your car and not two different chassis brands shock mounts in different locations and the numbers will definitely vary and and also make sure you do it in the air you know not pulling the car around on the ground and that kind of stuff so i would definitely recommend it well the thing that's neat about the tools that we have today is the fact that Back in the day, we used to make changes to the car and we made the car better. Well, my question was, well, why did why did it make the car better? Because I want to try to repeat that. I mean, if it made it better once, it's probably going to make it better again. Where now we have tools that say, this is what happened. This is what you need to do. And it just gives you those numbers or you know, all of a sudden the car sucked. Well, you check these numbers, well, how do these numbers get off? What, what happened? What, what, you know, what's going on? It, it gives you the answer to the question, so to speak. I, I'm not one of these guys, I, you know, I never was a wing it guy. Uh, I always kind of wanted to know if we did this, what can we expect from this? And why did it do this? And back in the day, you, you just, you kind of had to wing it and, Hope for the best and use your old weight jack checker like I used to use on my late model to, to, to pull, lift it up each individual wheel. Because you know, back then we didn't think about scales. That, that was a weight checker and that worked out pretty good. That's how we scaled the car technically. But at least that gave us some data. I mean, it was better than nothing. Um, what are you more worried about hitting your right front caster target numbers at static or in dynamic as some cars will gain more than the others? Well, you need to actually check that the best you can or ask your chassis manufacturer if he can tell you that, but you'd be better off to know that yourself, set your caster at a, a specific degree in static mode and then actually check it in dynamic mode so you know what it gains to. Because once again, it's still, in my opinion, it's where we end up is what's most important. Because 
the car will never see static. Once once you roll up on the racetrack, it'll never be in static mode ever again until you actually park it back in the pits. So knowing what it gains too is what's most important. So in, in my opinion, I still think having both of those numbers, it's a lot easier to set it statically, but you got to know where it goes to to begin with because you might want to go four degrees, you might want to go six degrees, it depends on what the gain actually is. You need to actually check that. Um, let's see. Mike's got another question. Um, another question on the three link left rear chain drop. Should a person change drop for a heavy racetrack versus a slick racetrack? I don't know. You know, myself, I don't actually change that chain drop a whole lot. Um, on a heavy racetrack, I don't think it would be a bad thing to, you know, choke it up maybe a little bit. But then again, you might need more rear steer, so lengthening it out might be a better idea. I don't actually mess with it a whole lot. Uh, I'm one of them guys where, where I find that chain is, and so I get my degrees at 45 degrees and where that all works out to the point where the car is in dynamic mode with the chain being a certain amount and where it's steering a certain amount is kind of what I go for. And I try to stay within that realm most of the time. There's enough other things we can change on the car. The problem when you tighten that chain up, you're, you're going to take away from the right front. And, and God knows on a real heavy racetrack, we definitely need the right front to steer. So, you know. You could lengthen it up a little bit and you're going to get more steer. It would actually help you a little bit. Okay. Does it look like Mike's is the last question? That's all I got. That's all you got. All right, guys. Uh, we got time for one more question. Um, don't forget about the Harris Clash. 126 days, August 2nd. Deer Creek Speedway is going to be another great, another great event. 31 years. It's just amazing that that thing has lasted that long. I, I'm, I'm just very impressed how the racers have supported that thing for so long. I mean, it's, that's what we do it for, the racers. And, and it's just, uh, yeah, I, I just look forward to it all the time. Uh, if you don't have a weirdest load stick lead on the trailer, Okay, Kyle. That, that, um, can't wait till our new rear smasher. Hang on. Can't wait till our new rear smasher shows up. Should be a great tool for our program. Oh, you will have a lot of fun with that, Eric. You'll learn stuff you had no idea you even need. You might even learn some stuff you, whether you need to know it or not. It's just going to be good information, and you'll have a good time. Uh, thank you, sir. Old number seven, we appreciate it. Uh, pull bar, how much travel do you want before it limits out? Well, depends on the pull bar, depends on what sanctioning body you're running because uh, like an IMCA type car, inch and a quarter, inch and a half max, inch and a quarter is really pretty realistic. Uh, UMP car, you need to be in that inch and a half, inch and three quarters. Now, uh, Last week when we had uh, um, our UMP driver on this, um, anyway, he was telling us that he runs a, his UMP car. He actually ran uh, an inch and a quarter movement on it too. So kind of depends on the package, but inch and a quarter seems to be a pretty common number. A USA, USRA car, uh, yeah, USRA car, I would definitely be in the inch and a quarter. All right, uh, Mike, thanks for your questions. And all you guys, thanks for your questions. Again, it was a great night. We appreciate all your questions, and, and hopefully we were able to answer uh, as many of them as we could. I know there was a couple of them there that I didn't do a good job on, but uh, we'll get to some more information here and, and uh, see you here again in a couple weeks. Uh, thanks, sir. Two weeks from today would be the 11th, April 11th. 
So again, awesome. thanks, Chad. Thanks, guys. We had a great time, and, and uh, see you here in two weeks. Thanks.